Okay, guys, now we're going to talk about something called colligative properties. Okay, colligative properties are, um, they're kind of weird, but they're kind of cool, too. Colligative properties are physical properties of solutions, not of pure substances, but of solutions, that depend only on the number of solute particles present. So this is not about the identity of the solute, but only how much there is. So it's just the number of solute particles. And when I say it's not about the identity, there's sort of a limitation there. The identity matters just a little bit in a couple specific instances, but we'll, we'll get to all that. But what I want you to think about, the, the, this is true. All that matters for colligative properties and the, the magnitude is how many things, how many bits and pieces are sitting there dissolved in the water or dissolved in the solvent, no matter what the solute is. Okay, so there's, there's three things that adding a non-volatile, so what do I mean by non-volatile? Non-volatile means it doesn't evaporate quickly, right? It's not going to evaporate itself. So these are going to usually going to be things like solids, like sugar, salt, stuff like that. Adding a non-volatile sol solute to a solvent does three things. <coughs> it lowers the vapor pressure of the solution, it raises the boiling point, and it lowers the freezing point. Now, the first two are directly related to one another, and we're going to explore why this happens. But really, you just need to know that adding a solute, no matter what the solute is, does these three things to a solvent. So the, the solution. Um, and you'll be able to remember these because there's some common uses of these. Okay, so colligative properties. Um, so one of the first that I'm going to deal with, all right, all right. First one I'm going to talk about is the fact that adding a non-volatile solute lowers vapor pressure. So. The reason this happens is because if you imagine, so imagine how, um, remember we talk about vapor pressure being pretty much a measure of how quickly something evaporates, right? It's, it's determined by the vapor pressure necessary to reach equilibrium with the evaporation of a liquid. But we can think of it as a proxy for how quickly something evaporates. So as the molecules at the surface of the liquid are evaporating, right? This is what gives rise to a particular vapor pressure. The faster they're evaporating, the higher the vapor pressure. The slower they're evaporating, the lower. Well, remember, when you're talking about evaporation as opposed to boiling, only the molecules at the surface are escaping, right? So how does adding a, a solute affect this? Well, if you think about it, the solute particles are, are sitting dissolved in the liquid. Some number of them must be at the surface. And simply put, they're just occupying space that some solvent molecules would occupy, and some of them would have enough kinetic energy to get away from the surface. All this does is it effectively lowers the surface area and therefore brings down the rate of evaporation. If the rate of evaporation is lower, then the vapor pressure is lower. So that's pretty much how that happens. So the way this affects, this directly affects the boiling point. So hopefully you guys remember how vapor pressure and boiling point are related, right? So because the vapor pressure is lower, right, how is this related to, to boiling point? So vapor pressure and boiling point are related because something boils when the vapor pressure is equal to or greater than the atmospheric pressure. So if we lower the vapor pressure at all temperatures, remember, as I increase temperature, vapor pressure goes up, I'm going to have to bring the temperature up even higher to get it equal to that atmospheric pressure. So lower or raising the boiling point is a direct consequence of lowering the vapor pressure. And so, the, so that explains those two. So remember, decreases vapor pressure, and that in turn the boiling point. And the more solute you add, the greater these effects are. So, and it's just because the more solute there is, the more it's going to reduce the effective uh, surface area of the solvent. So, those two go hand in hand. The last one, which is one you may have personal experience with, is that a, a non-volatile solute adding to that, that to a solvent lowers the freezing point. So this is why 
we tend to put salt or other solutes on the streets when it's threatening to freeze. So what happens here, it's actually very, very similar to what's happening with the, um, what's happening with changing the boiling point. It's just a different phase boundary, right? So as solutes are trying to aggregate together to make a solid, right, as they're, as they're freezing, there's also an equilibrium of, sol of solvent, I said solute, solvent is trying to aggregate together to freeze to make a solid. There's an equilibrium of solvent molecules freezing and melting, right? And so, if they're in exact equilibrium, then the amount of solid neither grows nor shrinks. But if the melting is faster than the freezing, then it's shrinking and vice versa. Well, what happens is solute gets in the way of the solvent aggregating together, collecting together onto the solid surface. So it slows down one direction without slowing down the other direction, exactly like the whole boiling point thing, right? The solvent, um, the solute, prevents the solvent from evaporating but not from condensing in the same way it prevents it from freezing but not melting and this lowers the freezing point so, so there you go so lowers vapor pressure raises boiling point lowers freezing point the way I remember this the how it affects the boiling point and the freezing point is if you imagine so water freezes at zero degrees C and boils at hundred degrees C adding solute will increase that and decrease that. It effectively extends the range in both directions over which the solvent remains liquid. So, there's another bit here. So, again, what the solute is doesn't matter. The nature of the solute, the identity of the solute is unimportant. Or rather, I should say, the nature of the particles doesn't matter. But if you imagine this, Imagine adding, making a 1.5 molar solution of sodium chloride versus a 1.5 molar solution of magnesium chloride. What's going to be the difference between the two? Remember, what do ionic compounds do when they dissolve? They dissociate. So the sodium chloride is going to dissociate into one sodium ion and one chloride ion per formula unit. The magnesium chloride right, is going to dissociate into one magnesium ion and two chloride ions per formula unit. So, magnesium chloride, right, represents more solute particles than an equivalent concentration of sodium chloride, because three versus two particles that it's going to break into. So, 1.5 molar magnesium chloride actually increases the boiling point more then making a solution of 1.5 molar sodium chloride, increasing the boiling point off of the pure solvent. So, this is going to be a greater effect. The way you can figure this out effectively, a given ionic compound has an effective solubility, wherein colligative properties are concerned, of whatever you get when you take the concentration times the number of particles it makes when it dissociates. So sodium chloride is going to have an effective concentration, wherein affecting colligative properties matters, of 3 molar, but magnesium chloride will be 4.5 molar. So the effect is greater for magnesium chloride. So let's look at this next one. How will the vapor pressure of 1 molar magnesium or sodium chloride, right? So times 2 particles gives you 2 molar, effectively versus the vapor pressure of 0.75 molar. And there's going to be four particles there. And so that gives me an effective concentration of three molar. So the effect is greater from sodium, uh, sodium phosphate. So how will the vapor pressure be of 1.0 molar sodium chloride compared to the vapor pressure of 0.75 molar sodium phosphate? phosphate well, the vapor pressure of the sodium phosphate will be lower. Actually, I should say, technically, the sodium phosphate solution should be lower because there's a greater effect and adding more solute lowers the vapor pressure. 